Hey guys, this is Rodeska, and I wanted to come to you with a video tutorial for creating sci-fi panels, uh, excuse me, sci-fi trim sheets inside of Blender um, and Marvel, uh, excuse me, Marmoset. So what this is going to do is it's going to go over mo the modeling process, which is going to be extremely easy. And then the baking process will hopefully be easy as well. And I'm going to go over some trips, tips and tricks as to how to get some pretty decent results from your... Uh, modeling. All right, so let's get started. All right, so as you can see right here, we have our sci-fi scene. It's got a couple of uh, display cue, uh, display cylinders as well as some low poly um, poly planes that I've placed the, the stuff on. And in order to get this result, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to Blender and I'm going to show you all of the things that I did to get the best results. So essentially what this is, is it's just modeling. Um, all you're doing is you're just modeling, so you're doing what you already do naturally. Uh, one of the things you definitely want to do is you want to gather references of like trim sheets, sci-fi stuff, things like that that you can find off of uh, Pinterest or Google or whatever. And you're going to put that into a program that I like to use called Pure Reference. So if I actually start up Pure Reference, um, this is essentially... Uh, this is essentially what I have. I just have a couple of references... Um, some things to get me inspired to doing all of this stuff. Um, it's pretty much necessary for if you're going for any kind of stylization or anything like that, or even if you're going for uh, realism, you want to have references so that you can get the best results and, you know, just have a direction as to where you're going. So this is what I used for my references. All right, some great artists in here. If I could, I would reference them all in the description, but I don't know. I got this off, all off of Google. So we're going to close out of this. And essentially what I did was I started off with a low poly uh, plane. And with that low poly plane, I essentially used like uh, um, N-GON surfaces to model these shapes. So if you don't know how to do that, it's basically easy. It's just, you know, you go in there and you go in. And what I did was I actually uh, scaled this up, this poly plane up to about 10, um, just to get a nice kind of radius uh, to work with. And then what I did was I just went in there and I added some subdivision cuts, um, obviously. And, you know, if you hit Control-B, you can then bevel that and get some, you know, nice things going. And essentially, yeah, then what you can do is you can actually go into here and you can pretty much, like, go in and press X, dissolve these, uh, dissolve these, um, Let's actually make sure that we have uh, an extra layer in here. Dissolve those. And essentially this is what I did. I just went in and I just kept on like going in here and, you know, adding some cuts and everything and making sure that I was able to um, do this kind of thing. So then what you can do is you can just kind of add, you know, Another cut through here, control bevel that, and then you have essentially this piece right here that you can just kind of bring out and work with it. And that's all essentially, that's what I did with this, um, but there's also a, uh, a lot more to it. So if we go into here, you'll notice that there are some things that are actually, uh, they're not attached to it. So I'm trying to think of an example. Um, let's actually Let's actually duplicate this. So if I hit uh, Shift D to duplicate, uh, you can see that there are some things that are uh, attached to it. These are called floaters. And if you don't know what a floater is, it's basically just geometry floating directly above the surface of another geometry um, in order to bake that down. Or you can actually use that as uh, an actual uh, surface um, to kind of... Uh, give the illusion that there's depth there on this flat surface when there's not. So what I'm doing this for is I'm actually doing this to bake into. And I actually have a couple of these. As you can see right here, I have this one. And you can see how high up it is and how high these can go. Um, and I'll show you why in just a second as to why I did it that high. Uh, but as you can see, I have another one right here that's kind of like a cupping shape. So don't, um, and before I try, this is all before I triangulated it, obviously, because you can see that these aren't triangulated, but the plane is. 
Um, so don't triangulate the mesh right away. Uh, do that when you're exporting or even if you have to do it, you know, before you export. But it's necessary that you keep it um, in GONS before you do before you export it simply because it's easier to work with. All right. So just make sure you're keeping it as in GONS and you're not keeping it, you know, you don't triangulate it too quickly. Um, the only reason why I did is because I was already done with this. I had nothing more I needed to do with this. I was already satisfied with the way it looked. However, if you're still working on it, do not triangulate the mesh, all right? So now what you now what I have here is I have like these uh, surfaces. And the reason why I did this is because when you bake inside of Marmoset and you turn on object ID, what that does is it looks at every single individual object in your file and it goes, okay, there's all of these objects. I'm going to make a color for every single one of these objects. However, if you merge these two objects together, if you merge these floaters with this object, it will look at that as one object. Okay, that's extremely important because when you bake it, um, you're no longer going to get multiple colors for those objects. You're going to get one color, all right? And that's better for texturing, okay? So make sure that if you are um, uh, doing this floater thing that you actually merge the floaters with the uh, proper object that they go with, okay? Um, and floaters are pretty easily, uh, pretty easy. All you have to do is just basically make like a cool shape and then, you know, bring it up or down and, um, you know, you don't have to worry about cutting into the actual geometry behind it. You can just make a floater and then just bake that. All right. However, if you wanted to make this, obviously, if you wanted to make this more 3D, then you would obviously create the geometry inside of that. Like I did with the plane, you know, I made this plane more 3D. Um, but that's the topic for another time. All right. So essentially I made this, uh, you know, these floaters, I made these pipes in here. I actually just used a curve to make the pipe. What I did with that is I just kind of um, made a subdivision along here, took that, took that edge, um, separated it, and then converted it as a, if you go over to your object and you go to convert, you can convert that edge to a curve. And then I just did a depth. Um, so I went to the curve options and I just, uh, increase the depth of that. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, if I actually add a curve and bring that over here and then go over to my curve modifier, or my curve uh, options, um, if you go over to your depth, you can actually increase that and make a pipe as you can see. So it's very good for that. All right. And all essentially that's all I did is I just made a bunch of geometry that was floating above um, the geometry. As you can see, I even have geometry that's like weird like that. I have some uh, tube shapes. I have some bolts. I have some uh, floaters above other objects. So this object right here is also floating above this one. As you can see, I combined this floater with this object. Um, you know, I have objects like this that are just randomly placed. It's all just placed. And uh, I usually work um, with a combination of perspective and top-down view just to see, like, you know, what could be more interesting? What can I do that makes it more interesting? Um, and uh, yeah, I even got some a little bit of polygonal modeling right here with, you know, this kind of object um, to make it more interesting. And of course, you know, I separate this separate this object from this object just so I get different colors between these objects when I'm baking it. And uh, that's essentially all I did. All I did was just model some interesting shapes, put them above even, you know, complex shapes like this. You know, you can make some weird shapes. You don't even have to make the bottoms of this shape um, because, again, it's just going to bake from the top down. All right, it's not going to bake from like sides or underneath or anything like that like normal geometry would if you were, you know, retopologizing a character or whatever. So it's just going to bake from the top and it's going to go down. All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go into Marmoset and I'm going to show you the baking options that I made. Okay. So here's all my scenes set up and, you know, it's very unorganized. So I'm very sorry about that. But if you go into my bakes, um, you can see that I have obviously my bake objects. I have my high and my low. Um, and for the low, I just increased the cage as far up as I possibly could. Uh, if you're getting bad results with your cage, just increase it a little bit higher. Just mess around with this value. Um, the higher you go, the more it's going to capture from the top down. Um, so, you know, there's that. And uh, what else am I trying to say? Oh, yeah. And then in my baking, I actually ended up going with... Uh, Obviously, 64 samples, extreme padding, uh, and then these are all the maps that I baked. I baked the object ID map, the ambient occlusion. The ambient occlusion was really wonky 
at first, but then I kind of uh, increased the search distance a little bit and it actually ended up doing a lot better. So just make sure you increase the search distance if you're having a problem with that. And the object ID obviously is going to replace my material ID or my, my, my vertex ID. So it's gonna look for every single object, like I said, and it's going to say, okay, this is a different object. It's gonna be a different color. And what I mean by that is if I actually go into here and I turn on my ID, you can see every single thing that is a different color. And that's actually kind of cool. Um, every single thing that is a different color inside of my ID. And this is going to help you with Substance Painter and um, going inside of Substance Painter and uh, texturing these in different uh, kinds of details. But however, this is for me, this is actually kind of cool. Um, I might actually just take the ID map in there and get rid of... Uh, the greens um, and just leave kind of the reds and just desaturate the reds a little bit and that'll actually make some some cool copper kind of like uh, look um, and some variated metals but yeah this is essentially um, the ID map everything that it saw it baked it out as a different object now there is a problem because this workflow right now it is very good for going back and forth uh, i can add new stuff into there however every time you add something new inside of blender it adds a new material to it or um, it says that there is no material so what that what happens is when you actually add a material and uh, you don't have an object that has a assigned material what's going to happen is it's going to assign this material and then when you bake it's going to bake this materials normals onto itself that sounds really weird, but when you go when you bring back in your models, your high poly model, you want to basically just go in here, um, uncollapse this, and then go in and say, okay, uh, I want to assign just the default material to it, just a blank material. Okay, this material has no textures on it at all, um, and that'll fix your problems because you'll have overlapping textures, which will look really horrible. Okay, so every time you go back into Blender and you make a new object. Um, let's say you make some cables or whatever, uh, and then you want to re-export it, make sure you reassign a default material to it or else um, you'll have some problems later on. Uh, either that or you can just assign a material right away inside of Blender and, you know, that'll be your, your object. The only reason why I don't do that is because every single time you make a new object, you have to assign the same material over and over and over again, and it kind of gets a little tedious. So I just say, fuck it. I'm just going to export the high poly into here. I'm just going to assign a material to every single thing all at once. And then boom, um, uh, bake it and I'm good to go. I don't have to do all these like little extra steps of like assign material, assign material, assign material. I just have to do it once for everything and it's good to go. All right. So there you have it. That's uh, all I did inside of uh, Blender. Uh, hopefully this helped you guys out. I know it wasn't an, a super in-depth tutorial, but I kind of just wanted to get you guys the idea as to how you can make your own trim seats really, really fast inside of uh, Blender and bring them over to Marmoset to uh, bake them, okay? So remember, your cage has to be set pretty high above your 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 stuff in order for it to bake uh, properly, break, bake everything, and uh, all you have to do is just make some really cool, interesting shapes from the reference images that you found um, that are inspirational and uh, then you just export it to whatever program substance painter or whatever to uh, texture all right take care guys and uh, hopefully again this hopefully this has helped you